Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, getting ready for New Year's, how do you predict the price of your product in the middle of wild price swings? In Southern Gardening, Gary Bachman says it's time to plan. Deer meat, it's what's for dinner for some. And before you know it, everyone will be planting. Many of them will be hiring this guy. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. With the new year just around the corner, imagine you're one of only 100 growers serving 6,000 eager customers who sell more than 20,000 brands of a single product. How do you predict the price in a situation like this? Here's Peter Tubbs. 60 acres of trellised vines in Yakima County, Washington, are home to a key component of America's burgeoning craft beer business. The hops grown here add the bitter flavor in beer, that snap on the palate, which comes from the variety and volume of a primary ingredient used in the brewing process. For craft brewers like Nick Bowes of Rock Island, Illinois, the decision on how much of the indispensable spice to use in Bent River Brewing's newest offerings is a delicate balance. So we have a fairly knowledgeable uh, market, you know, around here, and uh, they they want the breweries to, you know, what's new, what's next. They want to see, see, you know, every time they come in, they like to see a different beer that they can try. For brewers, the customer-driven pursuit of hop flavor creates a price conundrum, finding the right hops at a profitable price. However, brewmasters often purchase the vital ingredient blind because the market lacks transparency. Part of the problem is the size of the market. While the industry generates two billion in sales each year, less than 100 growers produce the majority of American hops. With over 100 varieties in use, there are essentially 100 separate markets, each susceptible to price swings due to demand, weather, rumor, and fashion. Douglas McKinnon has worked in the hops industry since 2000. Uh, we know roughly where the prices have been, and we know roughly what the market will bear. And so then you somehow in the middle there have to calculate your profit and then try to negotiate a good deal with the, the growers. To avoid being caught in a scarce price environment, both brewers and merchants contract hop sales, often three to five years into the future. Farmers benefit by removing some of the variability in their incomes. Merchants have a destination for the hops they buy during harvest and brewers get predictability in their production pricing. Uh, we usually end up about uh, third quarter every year trying to sell off some of our excess from our contract because again, you know, I'd rather be slightly over contracted than just be not unable to produce one of our core products. The journey of hops from hop yard to beer glass has multiple steps. The hops must be separated from the vine then sent to a kiln for eight hours to be brought below 10% moisture. Then packaged in 200 pound bales for storage at 34 degrees until they can be either compressed into pellets or converted to an extract. Hot pellets, if properly stored, have a shelf life of up to three years. Canned extract is good for a decade or more. The multi-year shelf life of hops can actually make a spike prone market more volatile. With no standardized inventory data, a bountiful harvest in one production year can depress the market for several years to come. Higher demand from the craft beer industry has boosted United States hop production 28% since 2000. As an affordable luxury, a young generation of beer drinkers has adopted craft beer over the mass market beer their fathers drank. This market shift has encouraged the installation of thousands of acres of hops in the Pacific Northwest, worrying some that a crash in hop prices may be on the horizon. So what happens is the, the hop industry is never in balance. It's never, it never finds equilibrium. It, so it's always either oversupplied or undersupplied. 
craft brewing uses dramatically more hops than conventional brewing, and craft beer continues to carve market share away from national beer brands each year. Hop production is expanding to meet demand, with 8,300 acres added in 2016, the third consecutive year of double-digit percentage growth. The Gamash family has been farming hops in the Yakima Valley for 75 years. So by, hopefully, by the time that you're harvesting your crop, you already know what you're going to get for it and where you're going to deliver it. The arid Yakima Valley is an ideal growing region for hops, and the climate allows farmers to reconfigure their yards to meet changes in demand year to year. But the opacity of the hop market makes those moves risky without long forward contracts with merchants and breweries. The capital requirements of hops are immense. 10 acres of new hops can cost a half million dollars to install and grow the first year but can gross $12,000 per acre annually. And any plans to process hops require a minimum $2 million capital investment up front. This includes the separator and kiln required to prepare the hops for storage and eventual processing into a format brewers can use. High startup costs acting as a barrier to entry for prospective growers, coupled with the volatility of the hop market, has led to legacy operations with many on their third and fourth generation in the valley. The institutional knowledge is important to weather the lean years when hop prices collapse. Guys that I'm drinking beers with, uh, one day my grandfather probably drank beers with their grandfather. And... Most operations are diversified across crops and calendar. Crews will pick hops, grapes, or apples depending on what is ready that day. I think we're going more in the direction of the English style pub where local is really important, but there's tons of room at the bottom of the scale where you, know, you have a guy who's a brewer in their neighborhood and they have five, 10,000 loyal customers. There's tons of room for that. And if that's the trend in the market, we could easily have 10 or 15,000 breweries in this country in the next few years. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Planting may be the last thing on your mind right about now, but Gary Bachman says now is the perfect time. Here he is with an explanation. You may say that it's too late to be planting shrubs, but I say now is the time you should be planting. Let's take a look at a few that I think have good landscape potential. A shrub I love is Sunshine Ligustrum. This is a fast-growing, compact shrub with beautiful golden ornamental foliage. It's a multi-stem shrub with dense upright growth. The golden color of the small glossy oval leaves is enhanced by sun exposure. So plant in the full sun for best performance. The new leaves emerge light green and transition to their bright colors for summer. Sunshine Ligustrum will hold its golden color for winter, sure to spice up the dreary winter landscape. Now I don't normally like shrubs shaped like little green balls in the landscape, but I make an exception for Globosa nana cryptomeria. This evergreen selection has a natural bowling ball shape requiring no shearing. The foliage is fine textured. This plant would make a fantastic landscape specimen only growing to about three and a half feet. Winter cassia is certainly one of those show-stopping plants, especially considering the prolific blooms in the winter season. Who wouldn't want to see the mass of bright yellow flowers in their landscape? Beginning in November, the flowers are displayed in spike-like clusters, each having up to 12 individual blossoms. The clusters form towards the branch tips. Planting in the full sun will reward you with the best flower production. I really think these are good landscape choices, plus all three are deer resistant. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. The price of our latest average Thanksgiving feast for 10 was $50, the lowest in a while. But even so, the USDA says one in eight Americans' food is insecure. 
Some agencies are on a mission to help those in need and getting a boost from hunters. It brings the wildlife in and then it allows that soil to kind of, kind of come back a little bit from being farmed for years and years. Only about half of Mike Nelson's acres in central Iowa's Warren County are devoted to row crops. He's invested the remainder of his rolling landscape in USDA's Conservation Reserve Program. My whole family, the one thing that we enjoy the most is the outdoors and the wildlife that comes with it. And I think a lot of this ground is ground that shouldn't be farmed. It's highly erodible. By having a portion of his land in CRP, Nelson cost shares the conversion of his farm ground to retain topsoil, improve water quality, and restore natural habitat. However, one woodland creature can respond a little too well to such rural accommodations. As a hunter, that's what we want to see. That's telling us that we have a buck in the area. Iowa corn and soybeans might help feed the world, but those same growing areas provide shelter and nutrition for four-legged drifters, which some landowners consider a nuisance. They'll just devastate our crops, and, and if we didn't harvest some of those, we'd just get overrun, and, and we'd have way too many deer. But Nelson has found a way to decrease numbers in his own backyard and uproot hunger locally, thanks to a partnership between outdoorsmen, meat lockers, nonprofits, and state government. We've got as many top 100 scored deer in the country as any other state. We've come on strong. Um, you know, we have one of the most in-demand non-resident deer licenses. We do limit those to 6,000, but our bow deer tags are probably the most in-demand deer license in the country. Iowa Department of Natural Resources spokesman Mick Clemisrud says about 15 years ago the DNR hatched a plan to cut back on a deer population that had become a hazard in urban areas. What followed was the statewide HUSH program, or Help Us Stop Hunger, which allows hunters to donate excess harvest to those in need. Roadkill is not allowed for contribution. Iowa's deer are world-class deer, and they're really a prestigious animal to hunt. And what we've done is we've structured our season so we can make sure that those large-bodied animals can pass their genetics on before the gun season starts. Not a lot of other states do that, and they don't have the same deer quality deer herd that we do. DNR officials estimate Iowa's current deer population at roughly half a million. Clemisrud says herd size spiked around 2007, and an uptick in hush donations followed at over 8,300 animals the following year. The program's first decade saw over 63,000 deer, equaling more than 10 million meals provided by Iowa hunters. Last year, about 3,800 deer were donated, with the largest number coming from Milo, Iowa. Milo Locker co-owner Daryl Goring says that's just shy of 19,000 pounds, and they fully expect to top those numbers when 2018's contributions are tallied next spring. We are in deer country. South Central Iowa is a great place to be if you're a deer hunter, and uh, we're, just, we're just blessed to be here. Processors receive $75 from the state for each animal. The meat is shredded and packaged in two-pound chubs, equaling eight meals each, according to state officials. Real lean, lean red meat. So if you're watching your cholesterol or things like that, then deer's a good thing to eat. Goring says all parties involved benefit under the agreement. And together they've streamlined how hunters contribute. All a hunter needs to do is uh, legally harvest a, a white-tailed deer, properly tag it, field dress it, bring it in. It's really, you know, two minutes and the paperwork's filled out, little index card, and he's good to go. And uh, we take over from there. Over 60 lockers participate in the program and work with seven food banks serving those who are food insecure across the state. Danny Ackright, communications manager with the Des Moines-based Food Bank of Iowa, says proteins like meat are one of the most difficult nutritional products to come by. But in 2017, his nonprofit received almost 73,000 pounds of venison through Hush. And he points out the huge advantage of being able to take the show on the road. 
One of the misconceptions that a lot of people have about those who are hungry is that it's an inner city problem, when really it's an everywhere problem. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. And really, in our rural communities, is one of the hardest places to reach them. They may not have access to traditional food resource like a food pantry or a soup kitchen. So we have to, to design programs like the mobile food pantry to go in and meet those needs in those rural communities. Venison? Oh, I think it's great. I'm not a Des Moines driver, not even very far. So it is nice to have it come to Milo. You know, it's really, really helped. Ackright says feedback from recipients, as well as those canvassing woods and fields, has been overwhelmingly positive. One of the things that I love to hear is when hunters tell us that they are active hush hunters. For them, it's a sport of passion. They love to do it. They will hunt and take down a deer and help feed their own family. And when they have the ability to provide that, that nutritious meat to a family in need, that means something to them. Make chili with it. Mike Nelson agrees. From tree stand or deer blind, he helps manage an Iowa resource with high reproduction rates and few, if any, natural predators. One deer for us is plenty. Otherwise, it'd just go to waste in one of two ways. You'd either have it processed and it sit in your freezer and you'd never eat it, or you wouldn't harvest the deer to begin with and then you'd just be overrun with them. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. We'll take a short break here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, it's not Top Gun, but they're still buzzing the heartland. Despite the increased use of drones, crop dusting pilots are still a major air force in agriculture. These guys won't be flying off into the sunset anytime soon. Top off your tanks, we're shoving into overdrive with a former GI now flying the friendly skies over Iowa. That is coming up on Farm Week. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. For the final feature story of the show, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First on January 3rd at the EMCC Lion Hills Center and Golf Club in Columbus, Mississippi, it is the MTA Turfgrass Road Show with workshops on sports field management, choice of grass, pest and weed control, what's new in the industry, and a lot more. The price for members is $65, $85 for non-members. For information, call 662-769-7558. Next, from January 8th through the 10th in New Orleans, it's the Beltwide Cotton Conferences. This is another packed convention on current research and emerging technology to improve production, processing, and marketing efficiency. Conferences include cover crop initiatives, new products, pest management, just to name a few. For more info and to register, visit the conference website at cotton.org slash beltwide. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Ready for a ride? Crop dusters are still flying just about everywhere in America. There are more than 1,400 pilots in the U.S. dusting millions of acres of crops while avoiding power lines and water towers and the ground. Here's Josh Bittner. Flying is the ultimate freedom. You leave the ground and all your problems, all your worries, they're behind you. Like it's you and it's the airplane. Agricultural aviator Jordan Omstead is entering his fifth year of flying the friendly skies over his home state of Iowa. After graduating the Air Force Academy in 2006, Omstead spent time in Afghanistan and Iraq in the military and as a private contractor before coming home to pursue a childhood passion. I like to tell people I had to get out of the Air Force to start my flying career. My dad was a pilot. I grew up on a farm, so this is the combination of agriculture and aviation. So I get to be a part of all the attributes that I really love. So. 
USDA figures reveal the Hawkeye State, a national leader in corn and soybean production, planted over 23 million acres of both crops combined in 2017, at a value of $13.6 billion. But even robust yields are susceptible to pest, disease, and fertility pressures, which, if left unchecked, can negatively impact farm revenues. That's where pilots like Amstead soar into the picture. The vast majority of what we do is insecticide and fungicide. Aerial application, or crop dusting, began nearly a century ago in the U.S. and over time has reaped the benefits of technological advancement like other wings of agriculture. Several types of growers and ranchers can employ the method, along with herbicides, dry fertilizers, and cover crop seeding. According to the National Agricultural Aviation Association, a Washington, D.C.-based industry advocate, nationally, 71 million acres of cropland are treated from above every year, in addition to millions of acres of pasture and rangeland. In Iowa, that amounts to a more than $214 million annual industry, with the mix applied to around 5 million acres, as estimated by the Iowa Agricultural Aviation Association. We actually put it on better than a ground rig, because a ground rig, they'll go out there in winds that we won't work in. Cliff Crowell owns Stardust Ag Aviation. He taught Amstead the trade before hiring him as a subcontractor, and will one day pass the business down to him. Crowell, a Navy veteran, launched his career in crop dusting over 20 years ago, landing in Iowa by chance. When I got out of the military, I had a buddy that lived here. So I flipped a coin and told him uh, Des Moines, Iowa, at Little Rock. We went uh, head, so I wound up in Des Moines. <laughs> Though ground applicators might have a different take on best methods, Crowell says diligence is paramount to ironing out any shortcomings. We had, do have some drift problems, but we're dealing with those and working with those constantly as far as the safety aspect of it. But uh, no, I think the, uh, the airplane does a better job and is a safer way of applying it. Critics charge all manner of spray applications are susceptible to contamination and runoff, which can threaten the environment and human health. But aerial proponents point out all of their liquid pesticides are approved by the Environmental Protection Agency and say they employ precision techniques. Without getting into a lot of aerodynamics, just the forces coming off this wing are pushing the, the air behind the airplane down into the crops. And the way we've got the booms positioned, they're releasing chemical into that air. So it forces it down with it. That said, the closer we are to the crops, the less fall time there is for that chemical to evaporate. So we get just as close as we can safely. Amstead references the myriad safety precautions emphasized by the industry and his mentor, like pre-flight analysis, annual inspections, and scouting fields for people, obstacles, and other hazards. Safety is always an issue, just like ground-based applications or that type of thing. We want to make sure that we're doing it correctly and well. Recently retired Iowa State Extension Agricultural Engineer Mark Hanna emphasizes the land-grant university's outreach efforts to local flight crews, while national training to calibrate equipment also takes place ahead of flight season. We spend a, a fair bit of time every year working with aerial applicators, doing a good patternation check off their aircraft, uh, making sure that we've got a, a, a good uniform application, make sure that we don't have uh, some of the things that, that might cause some, some off-target movement or drift on that aircraft. Over the past several years, Stardust Ag Aviation has seen a steady rise in customers seeking aerial cover crop seeding. Released at a higher altitude than spray liquids, the boom accounted for over 10% of the company's business in 2017. That's good news for Iowa, which is highly susceptible to runoff. Cover crop has some distinct uh, advantages, particularly for water quality. Uh, it helps keep soil in place, but another thing it does is it uses nutrients uh, down in the soil, and particularly nitrates. Some see growth areas for conservation and precision agriculture as food production increases to serve a growing global population. Going forward, 
Hannah says it's possible the industry could benefit from unmanned systems working in tandem with pilots. But for Amstead, it's easy enough now to use an iPhone to map routes to his customers' fields and listen to his favorite playlists all day long. Sometimes there's some classic rock in there, sometimes there's some Beethoven, just a little bit of everything. Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. What a ride, huh? <laughs> Looks like fun, but tough day at the office. Tough day. Sure. <laughs> well, next week on Farm Week, an uh, interesting look back on Canadian dairies. We've heard all year long about a steep Canadian tariff on American milk. Well, unlike dairies in other parts of the world, the Canadian producer's price is set and the supply managed to protect income. We're told there's a cost for that stability, but a trade group disputes the claim. How does the Canadian system work? Should we try it in the States? That's next time on Farm Week. And a reminder, if you miss a story, always look for the past episodes at our website, farmweek.tv. And as always, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We will see you next week. Happy New Year. Thanks for watching.